to a section of scripture that's extended, um, and I like to make comments on a lot of things that are in the scriptures. I wanted to give us a very succinct preview of where we're going in this section of scripture from the first chapter of Acts. Of course, everyone completely understands that this is in between time. That Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven and he's told his disciples that he wants them to stay in Jerusalem because he's going to clothe them with power. But uh, what happens in the in-between times? We read all of the Bible stories and the events of scripture and we have healings and um, all kinds of events, miracles that take place, significant events take place. And we think, well, that's Christianity, all these marvelous things, miraculous things that take place. But actually, Christianity is more like the 10 days between the Ascension and Pentecost. Ordinary time. That's what we call it. The Lord wants to use ordinary time to sanctify, to train, to disciple His people. Not every day should be filled. We should expect to be filled with the miraculous and with God intervening. And God has really most of the history of the people of Israel and the church has just been ordinary days, people doing ordinary things, and God shaping and forming His people through priorities in their life that makes them a unique people set apart for Himself. And we'll find four of those priorities in this ordinary time of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So I want to call your attention to four priorities that we uncover here in this last section of Acts chapter 1. First is the priority of prayer. Christians pray. Uh, apart from our regeneration and the change that takes place when Christ uh, frees our heart to love Him and His purposes before we were enemies of His, but when the Spirit quickens us to faith, uh, that's the most significant change in our life. But talk about something outside of that event and our commitment to Scripture that which is the flavor of the Christian life is to be a person who prays, who loves prayers. There are over a thousand prayers documented in the scriptures. People calling out on the Lord, praising Him in the good times, praying for people to be destroyed in the bad times. There's imprecatory prayers, there's prayers of praise and adoration, there's prayers of petition and supplication. This defines the language of the Christian. Pray without ceasing, we are told. And when Christians get together, they pray. Some of my most rewarding times here in Millington, these past 17 years, is to pray with other people in the city of Millington. Red and yellow, black and white, as they say, all calling upon the same Savior for the peace and prosperity of this town. And it's a blessing to be in those situations. And you will see the emphasis of prayer in this passage that we're covering. It needs to be that which molds your character and your convictions. The things you pray are an insight into your spiritual convictions and devotions. If your prayers are a laundry list of do this, do that, do this, and never, God, you are great and wonderful and awesome and I can't live without you, that's an indication of where your soul is at. And you need to let the prayers of the Bibles, of the Bible shape your prayers. Because this is how the saints address their sovereign Lord. A second priority is the priority of the scriptures. You'll remember in Luke chapter 24 that Jesus says to the disciples after he's been raised from the dead, Luke 24, 45, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. There was some motion of Jesus Christ to instill them with the Spirit's understanding of what the scriptures taught. And now they read the scriptures with a new light. They see something else that's happening in the scriptures. We might read a passage from the Psalms like we did today and think, man, King David had a lot of people who opposed him. That was a tough thing to be a king. But the, the apostles will read that scriptures and say, that's a fulfillment of Christ and the person of Judas. And we'd say, where did you put that out from? Where did, you, where did you get that? Because the apostolic authority of those men and how they viewed the spirit, showing them what the scriptures said, indicate to us 
Fulfillment of Christ in the scripture. Fulfillment of his ministry. They are the determining of a vast majority of what we interpret out of the scriptures. We are an apostolic church. And the spirit opened their eyes to understand the scriptures. And the spirit must open your eyes to understand the scriptures. We read an extended passage of King Solomon saying, God made promises to my father. God made promises. And I'm the answer to the promise. And we can say, no, Solomon, you're not the one to build a house for the Lord. The house you built is gone. But the house for the true son of David, the one born from the line of David, Jesus Christ, he is building the true temple of God. And the Bible says, we are the stones of that temple. And the spirit resides in us. The glory of God resides in us. Well, that's the way we need to view the scriptures now. Focused on the person of Jesus Christ. And it takes the spirit to indicate this to us. The fulfillment of those passages are far greater than even the Jewish people understand to this day. And there's a, I've seen some very powerful, powerful testimonies of Jewish people have come to the Lord saying, man, now when I read the scriptures now, <laughs> when I see Jesus all over it before I read it and thought this was about Israel, and about my nation, about my nationality, and about special privileges that I have, but no, it's all about Jesus Christ, and he is the Messiah, that's powerful. So the priority of prayer, the priority of the scriptures, and the priority to make wrongs right. We're going to learn about someone who did something exceedingly wrong. And there's no blame game. There's no complaining about it. It's like, this happened. This happened under God's plan. Let's make it right. Let's do something to, to make this situation that turned wrong and make it right to the best of our understanding of how the Bible teaches us to do it. We don't always know how to solve every problem that comes into our life. But again, the priority to prayer and scripture drove them to make something that was wrong right. And then finally, their priority to advance the Christian church. They have a new understanding of who they are. This is not just Israel 2.0. This is going to be something unique that God is going to do through them in the world. And they begin to understand that they are a new people set apart for God to do things for Him. Whereas other groups did not fulfill that calling. The advancement of God's kingdom is a priority. The priority to pray, the priority to read the scriptures, the priority to make wrong things right, and the priority to advance a Christian church. We will see these in Acts chapter 1, 12 through 26. You can turn in your worship folder and see that passage there, which I have uh, noted in the New King James Version. Verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, near, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So what we've read from Luke is that Jesus was taking them toward Bethany on his way up to the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of Jerusalem and is a taller mountain than the mountain on which Jerusalem sits. I told you I'm going to take you to Jerusalem in Israel, right? We're going to have to organize that pretty soon. Um, Jesus ascends from their presence. And they're going to walk back, and someone wants to know, well, how far was he from Jerusalem? Oh, 2,000 cubits. Not, not farther than a Sabbath day journey. On a Sabbath, you can only walk according to the Pharisaical law. And I'm looking at a couple passages from the Old Testament. You're only allowed to walk 2,000 cubits. Do you want to know why there's Jewish communities in certain cities? I, I understand there's one here in Memphis. In L.A., it was the Fairfax di district. Because all the Orthodox Jews can't live farther than 2,000 cubits from their synagogue. Right? Now, when I went to Israel and was in Jerusalem, and we were walking, I was all over that old city of Jerusalem. And to our guide one day, I said, you know, I've been noticing these poles. They're just a pole with a line on top of it. And that's not an electrical line. That's not a telephone line. What is that? What are these poles that extend out through the neighborhoods outside of the old city? Have I told you this story before? He says, oh, those are the walls of Jerusalem. And I said, excuse me? He says, yeah, they call those the walls of Jerusalem so they can live 
farther than a Sabbath day uh, journey from the old city of Jerusalem. They just call that the wall of Jerusalem so they can live that far away from the city. Isn't that sneaky? <laughs> All right. But this was a concern. This was a concern that Luke raises up that they were only about 2,000 cubits from the city of Jerusalem. When the ark came across with Joshua, the Jordan River, they had to stay 2,000 cubits behind that ark. All right. And then we learn this, verse 13. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room, which some say was the room where they had the Last Supper, or maybe some of the upper rooms in the temple. The temple complex was huge. And it could have been there, but they were in some upper room. And they were staying, and then we read this list. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. And we have over, in the other gospel accounts, the list of the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. And it's just a very interesting reaffirmation of who's part of this band, who went through all of this ordeal, and who's still with us. Well, it's obvious that one person's name is missing there. But it's also interesting is the construction of these lists. The first four are always the first four. The second four are always the second four. Peter is always number one. Peter's always the first one in every uh, disciple list. James, son of Alphaeus, is always number nine, and I don't know why, but there's three groups of four. And you can see also very interestingly that uh, Peter and Andrew were brothers, James and John were brothers, and then uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, seems to either have a son or a brother whose name is Judas. We often know him as Thaddeus. Bartholomew is also known as Nathaniel. And we actually don't know hardly anything about some of these guys, except that they were with Jesus all of his life, and they maintained the, the official title of now becoming an apostle of the church. These are the 12 disciples who become the 12 apostles, but we're going to have to meet that 12th one because Judas is gone. Verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Look at the unity that is among this group of men. After your leader leaves and you think maybe there might be power shifts and, you know, people saying, we got to do this now, we got to do No, they were all united. And that's a powerful thing. They're all united under Jesus Christ. But look who's also there united. The women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Mary, the famous Mary who gives birth to Jesus, is a part of this group. And other women are a part of this group. And in fact, now, when we read in the Gospels that Jesus' family wanted to take him away because they thought he was going a little loopy, now are following and are part of this new band of Christian believers. And extra credit for, for those who know the names of Jesus' brothers. Do you know them? If you read it in the Greek, you've got Jacobus, James, Joseph. That would be Joseph. Joseph Jr. Got to give him one there. Simon and Judas. Judas. Jesus had a brother named Judas. You have to remember that there was a man named Judas Maccabeus, the hammer. And he destroyed the Greek influence over the Jewish people. And a lot of parents named their son after this great hero of the history of Israel. Judas was his name. So a lot of men were called Judas in that day. Verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. 120. There's a number. Why didn't he say it was exactly 118? He says it's 120. And there I just cannot stop but say, why does he preserve the number 12? 12 and the number 10. 10 usually refers to earthly governments. 
And he's going to say, it's about 120. That is a biblical number. This is going to be the new people of God, the called out ones for him. In verse 16, men and brethren, Peter saying, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. So here's the recollection of the ministry of Judas. Jesus picked him. <clears throat> he hung out with us. He shared in every aspect of our ministry. Right? Uh, we don't see any indication except for people saying Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray, because this was all written afterwards. But in their ministry together, Judas didn't stand out as a problem or a troublemaker. Um, when Jesus said, someone's going to betray me, everyone starts saying, is it me? Is it me? They didn't all say, oh, we all know. <laughs> He's going to do it. He was a member of the discipleship core team and gave every indication of devotion to Jesus, but some... Where in his heart, in his life, there was dissatisfaction. And Judas becomes the fulfillment of all those references of the Psalms of someone who had sweet fellowship with Jesus and who would betray him. And then there's a, a reference to how his life ends in the book of Acts, verse 18. Now this man, speaking of Judas, purchased a field with wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akal Dama. Actually, it ends, in the Greek, it ends with a key, Akal Damak. This field of blood. Now, what's really interesting is about the gospel accounts we read about Judas and his betrayal and what happens with the 30 pieces that he gets. We read in the other gospel accounts that he's very remorseful and he regrets what he's done and he doesn't want the money, so he throws it back into the temple. And then we read that the Pharisees say, hey, we can't take this money, it's blood money. <laughs> we know what we, that money was for and we can't put that in the treasury. God won't smile on that, interestingly enough. So Judas throws the money back in. They take the money and they say, in the name of uh, Judas Iscariot, we're going to purchase the field where he hung himself. And evidently, while he was hanging there, the rope broke, a tree broke, a branch broke, and he, his body being dead already and bloated hit the ground. It it's just sort of talks about the character of this poor man's life. And so, um, you know, when we read in the Bible that Caesar... Uh, Caesar made a census. Caesar didn't do it. He didn't go out. He had it done. And when it says here that he had bought a field, someone did it in his name. And he said that this guy's mess of a life is going to be, he's going to own that field. He's going to own that property. And it's always going to be connected to a place, a, a bloody mess, basically. So there is a way to harmonize the passages of the gospel and this passage here in Acts, which tells us a little bit more information. Verse 20, so here's the commitment to the scriptures. It was written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Psalm 69 and 109 refer to these passages. So they're reading the scriptures and finding implications connected to the person of Christ and the ministry of Christ. And they even see the enemies of Christ and the judgment that comes upon them. And Peter, moved by the Spirit, says, i got to bring this up. And then he will say in verse 21, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Now, I love that little reference there. That phrase is a Hebrew idiomatic phrase. It shows up about 26 times. In the Old Testament, it is the type of character of a true minister of God. Moses receives this. Uh, faithful ministers who go into the, the tabernacle and come out. Jesus would say in his life, I'm the good shepherd and I will take the sheep in and I will take the sheep out. 
And when you get an assessment of your whole life of ministry, did you go in well and did you come out well? And Judas went in well, but he did not come out well. And we need to find someone who can come in and go out well, as all of the Old Testament narratives show us what a faithful leader is like, what a faithful elder, chief of a tribe, is someone who in their life does well, and when they're done with their life, they've done well. What a joy to, to bury men who did their jobs. And women as well, obviously. So here, Peter wants to rectify something that was wrong about their group. And he says in verse 22 that beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So because Judas had demitted his office and they needed to keep the number 12 as the people of God, Peter says, we've got to make this right. We need to put someone else in his position. And again, you don't see a lot of hand wringing and about how terrible Judas was. This was ordained by God. <laughs> and now God is going to ordain that another man take his place. Now, this is also something that I know that I could probably make, make some people mad, and I could really make you mad if I take this for a while. But listen, who is proposed but two men? If you ask me who would have been the best disciple, someone who had been involved in Jesus' life from his baptism to his death, maybe even from his birth to his death, I would think that Mary, the mother of Jesus, would have been the best disciple, the best choice. But they're not going to consider a woman. There's women in that group. But for the office, for office holders, they're going to be men. And that's what we keep learning from the scriptures. And I know that in some circles, people take offense to that. They will say, well, that's a cultural thing. Well, I'm sorry, um, the scriptures over and over again indicate that men should be in that position. Why? Because they're better than women? Absolutely not. I mean, I all know, I know why this church uh, hired me to be their pastor. It's because of my wife. That's obvious and easy to conclude. All right? But God has a special sanctifying purpose for men being in leadership. Did you hear that? God has a special sanctifying purpose for men to be in leadership. And it's not right for women to take over a man's job. And where those jobs lie, we can debate that in the culture. But in the church, men are supposed to be in those positions of authority. Not because they're more gifted. Not because they're more talented. Not because they're more educated. But out of deference and compliance with God's ordering of his church. It's the man who's supposed to head the family. And it's a blessing for the man to have a good wife to make that work. And I could say a lot more about that, but I just think it's very clear that these offices are reserved for men for the purposes of revealing how Christ wants his church to exist in this world. Verse 23, and they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who, surnamed, who was surnamed Justice. Uh, that's one of the reasons we named a boy Justice. There's three Justices in the New Testament, and they all have great commendation about them. And Matthias, and they prayed, here again, their prayers, and they said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. He is now the twelfth apostle. What do we learn about Matthias and his ministry? <clears throat> Nothing. There's... I mean, there's church tradition, but I'm not going to go there. There's no passage of scripture that really mentions Matthias ever again. But the number 12 is important. This is God's new community. This is God's new people. There was one who fell. So you replace him with someone who has the qualifications. They set out the qualifications, and they didn't back off those qualifications. <laughs> 
course, they, they drew lots, they took lots, they threw dice, or they pulled something out of a basket or something, and, and God made the decision. And I think, you know, romantically, I think that's great. Should men or, should, who should be the next elders of our church? Just bring up all the qualified guys, flip a coin. Hey, take care of it. But, uh, you know, even when Zacharias was to serve in the temple, when he was met by Gabriel, it says the only reason he was in the temple that day serving, because all the men from his division threw lots. And his, his name came up. That's the only reason he was in that temple that day, to meet the angel. But, you know, God was behind that. God made sure, and I wish God would help me with the lottery on that point, too. That would be really... Thank you. All right. Um, now we see after this, though, when it's time for officers, the church starts electing them. It's the saints who are filled with the Spirit who can identify who should shepherd them. It's not left up to chance anymore. It's left up to the people. It's, it's let, left up to the consent of the governed. And when the consent of the governed are empowered by prayer, scripture, making wrong things right, in advancing the church in very ordinary ways. This is how God's kingdom goes forward. And we see a powerful demonstration of it, even yet before the Holy Spirit is poured out on his people. These are convictions from God's people of old, and they will be convictions of God's people for eternity. And what we need to embrace in light of the gospel, the convictions of our own church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this testimony that speaks of a church that is not leaderless. There were men who were together of one accord. And the scriptures pointed out what their objectives should be. And their prayers brought them a call to ministry. We pray, Lord, that we would embrace the priorities li listed here. Uh, not as some kind of uh, self-help program to, to make a better church, but because this is what you draw your people to do and to be and to embrace. Uh, Lord, may we as a congregation and all those congregations that exist under the banner of Jesus Christ continue to keep these priorities uh, before them as they serve to minister the name of Jesus Christ to family, community, and world. In Jesus' name we pray.